Um, good to see you all. Welcome to the fall lecture series for 2023. Um, I think as most of you know, I'm Carrie Soden, the Archaeological Research Director here at the National Museum of the Great Lakes. It's good to see all of you again. It's been a seems like it's been a long, you know, four or five months since we started, since it was the spring lecture series, right? So thank you all for signing up, showing up, logging in. Um, please don't forget, you can always give at nmgl.org backslash donate. And we accept donations of all kinds at any time. Um, tonight, as I mentioned, is the second of our fall lecture series for 2023. For those of you online, don't forget if you need closed captions, just turn them on with the control bar at the bottom of your screen. If you have any problems with the Zoom portion, please log out and log back in as we see that seems to fix most of the problems that users have. Um, if anything were to happen to your feed tonight, we are taping this now that I've remembered to start the recording. Um, and we will have it up on our YouTube channel, hopefully by Monday or Tuesday morning. I will try and send an email out with that link to everybody that has registered when that happens. We will have a Q&A uh, period at the end of the talk. Those in your room, raise your hand. For those of you online, just post it in the uh, Q&A section and, and I will pose those to our speaker at the end of the program. All right, that's all the stupid stuff. Not stupid, but you know. Um, tonight we delve into something expanding a little bit on Great Lakes history and discuss a company and industry that started on and replied upon the Great Lakes. The Ford Motor Company has been an icon of Detroit, a town dependent on the Great Lakes trade. Um, tonight Ian will cover quite a bit, but I'm pleased to say that we're gonna talk not about Henry Ford, although we, we're gonna talk about Henry Ford, uh, but I'm pleased to say we're gonna talk about his employees and their energies. You know, What was it like for the everyday worker in a Ford plant? And I think we've talked about this a little bit. You know, We miss sort of that, I don't wanna use this overused phrase, common man. We miss that in terms of our sailors on the Great Lakes too. We know about the captains, we know about the engineers, but we don't know about the regular deckhands. So Ian's gonna tell us a little bit about that uh, in terms of the Ford Motor Company. Um, hopefully somewhere in there, there's a mention of a Ford boat or two. Uh, anyway, um, but within all this, uh, we have tonight Ian Ross. He's a lifelong resident of Northeast Ohio, grew up just south of Cleveland in the Lake Erie watershed. Ian is a 2011 graduate of the University of Cincinnati, where he received a Master of Arts in History with a specialization in 20th century American history. He's done archival and original research work for the Cincinnati Public Library and Walsh University, is a volunteer at the McKinley Presidential Library in Canton, Ohio, and is currently the Senior Lake Lorian and Program Director for Historical Lecture Series aboard the American Queen Cruise Lines ships Ocean Voyager and Ocean Navigator. Currently just passed since the ships just left. <laughs> but uh, he's, you know, I think some of you know, you know, with our our raffle and our, our association with American Queen Voyages, we we set up a Lake Lorian program and we were the sponsor for the Lake Lorian program and Ian was the Lake Lorian. So with that, I will turn it back over to him, hopefully, if I don't screw this up, which has happened a couple of times already tonight. Um, and we'll go from there. My floating meeting controls. All right, thank you, Ian. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, uh, Carrie. I've uh, gotten to work with her uh, quite a bit uh, over the uh, the last year or so. As she said, um, we sort of met initially through my connection with American Queen Voyages. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit more uh, of that history because I think it's uh, important to uh, to kind of know who your speaker is and where uh, they're uh, coming from. So uh, I am a musician in addition to being a historian. That's always what I sort of uh, did first and foremost was a performing musician. And that was also my job. I was the musical director on board the the uh, ships there on the American Queen Voyages. But I always had uh, a deep interest in history. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a grandmother who lived to be almost 104 years old. And so she was born in 1917 and told me all sorts of stories uh, uh, growing up in, in Canton, where I now live, that I never really got in the history books about some of the labor struggles and that sort of thing. And as Carrie uh, mentioned, one of the things I uh, really have an interest in and like to talk about, and so I will spend a, a sizable amount of this lecture discussing the sort of view from the bottom up. It is a very common 
uh, especially in more popular histories, to have the top-down sort of approach. And there's uh, a lot of compelling reasons for this. We love biographies, right? We're all individuals. And uh, so that is a, a compelling way to tell a story. But uh, unfortunately, there, as Carrie mentioned, there aren't always a lot of uh, records that you can do a comprehensive uh, biography of somebody at that ground level. So we kind of have to pick, pick apart bits and pieces to sort of build this thing from the ground up. So I will talk about uh, Henry Ford a little bit. But again, there's a lot of literature out there, a lot of great biographies. If you really want to get into that, uh, you can go and certainly do that. And there's many sites, Greenfield Village. Uh, all sorts of things you can go in and around in Detroit to find more about Henry Ford the man, although we will discuss a little bit that. But what I'm going to concentrate on in this is what the title of the, the lecture is, Manufacturing Men and Machines in the Pursuit of the Universal Car. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, Mr. Ford. Then we're going to talk about the car that he created, and it was originally just the universal car, uh, the Model T. And then really what we're going to concentrate on is the factory system, because for me and for my money, this is what I find to be the most interesting part of the story. And it's really what gets the car built. It's not necessarily the Tin Lizzie itself. Uh, there were lots of other people who could people and companies who could build a similar type of car. But it was really the way and the methods that the Ford company. And again, this is a much larger uh, sort of endeavor than even one man uh, could, could handle. Handle, although he's for certainly a pivotal figure, uh, it's really a whole host of people that get this uh, massive company and this massive production uh, happening. And then we're going to spend some time talking about those workers, because again, this is a, a group of people who often get lost. And I always like to do this. You won't be able to see this, unfortunately, those of you online, but you can maybe raise your hand sort of uh, uh, wherever you are. Now, how many of you here either are or are related to a multi-billionaire. Really, nobody. Surprisingly, I've never had anybody raise their hand. Now, how many of you have ever known someone or perhaps even yourself have worked in a factory? Wow, that's almost the entire room. So this is what I'm talking about. So this is your experience or what the experience would have been uh, uh, like for you. So I know many of you, uh, I, I see, have, have you already uh, came up and, and said something that you worked in the uh, uh, Ford factory. Now, we're not going to really be talking about your experience, although I'd love to hear about uh, that as well. This is one of the things that particularly this sort of ground up approach labor history is something that's always been very intriguing to me. Um, but we're going to talk primarily about the period from about 1908 until uh, really the beginning of the 1930s, although I will briefly touch on because of sort of current events with the uh, uh, auto strike, I will mention a little bit about the UAW and the coming in of unionization at Ford, which was really the, the last company to uh, adopt that of the big uh, three. So that's basically what we're going to be talking about. And then I'll briefly touch uh, just at the end uh, about sort of the impact of all this, because it really is the development of this Ford factory system and it, that factory system, again, that resonates right down to the present day. I mean, many of the methods and uh, uh, sort of designs that are built into the factory system are still what we see in sort of modern, you know, brand new companies like Amazon. Uh, and it really, uh, this, this ability to have the universal car becoming uh, increasingly being able to be uh, purchased by people of lower and lower economic status, that it really transformed our entire landscape. Because I'm guessing, did everybody come here in a car? Yes. Yeah, I can say that with a, a surety. And so uh, it's really, we take these things sort of for granted, but none of this was a given even as late as the 1930s, that this is the way that it was going to be. This all had to be built. Um, and so we're going to talk about that just a little bit and sort of the, the positive and the negative sort of uh, spillover effects uh, that, that have happened as a consequence of really becoming what one author uh, now calls car country. And that's a recent study that just uh, came out, basically not about Ford and the cars themselves, but about the whole infrastructure and social, cultural, economic system that gets built up around the motor vehicle and the personal motor vehicle uh, specifically. 
So, uh, oh, and I do want to mention too, uh, I, I'm sorry, folks online, I'll try to look at you periodically. This is a, a little bit different from me. Uh, I usually have either a handheld mic or an earpiece, and I like to walk around the room and point at things. And so I will try my best to uh, to adapt to the situation of having to uh, to stand here. And uh, again, sort of this, I don't know if it's my uh, musical background and the improvisation aspect, but I almost never give the same lecture the same way. And for this one, I did a massive overhaul took out some things, added some things, because I knew there was going to be some ship buffs in there. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the Ford fleet. Um, so it'll be shifting around, and then we'll take some questions at the end. And I will be very upfront with you. This is a massive topic, and I could talk about it for hours or days and never uh, uh, get to all of it. And there will be many things that I don't know. And this is something that all honest historians will admit. And so if I don't know something, I will uh, tell you that. And, you know, that'll hopefully, you know, encourage us both to learn. Maybe I can point you in the direction of a source, or maybe you'll inspire me to go out and sort of uh, search for the answers there. So, uh, we will mention briefly uh, about Henry Ford. He was born in 1863, just a few days after the Battle of Gettysburg to William Ford and Mary Liggett on a farm in that was then Dearbornville. It is now Dearborn, uh, Michigan. And we'll see a picture here of the homestead there. Uh, it has uh, been saved by Mr. Ford and it is on the grounds of Greenfield Village. So you can go and see this. Initially, he started with a smaller plot of about 40 acres that uh, he purchased from his father. Um, he eventually sold that and got a larger tract from uh, Mary Liggett's adopted parents. Uh, she was adopted by them and uh, they in inherited, uh, well, they had some transactions to acquire the farm before uh, they passed on and then they uh, acquired it. And as you can see, uh, you know, not not particularly ostentatious, not a tremendously large farm, but they were fairly well to do as 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 uh, farmers do. So it wasn't sort of rags to riches uh, uh, sort of story exactly. Now, unlike many of the other captains of industry of this time period, Mr. Ford actually was a real engineer. Can anybody pick him out? I can't really see which direction. So I'll just point him out to you. If it, can you see this on the, that's him there. Yeah. So he uh, loved the outdoors, loved the sort of uh, quietness of living in the country, but did not like manual labor. And so even as a child, uh, there are stories of him sort of uh, building little machines and things to help make the, the chores and work easier. And so already by 1879, he leaves the farm and moves into the city of Detroit and works his way up. And eventually, when you see him here, this is in March of 1893, he is one of the lead engineers for the Edison Illuminating Company. Uh, but this isn't going to be enough for him. And there's a, a number of stories that they tell this in great detail where he met uh, Mr. Edison and told him about the gasoline powered vehicle. And he said, uh, you've got it, boy, stick at it. And so uh, that was what he claimed was one of his inspirations for uh, going on and eventually leaving the Edison company to build his own vehicles. Now, one of the other aspects that uh, that doesn't get talked about. And the reason that uh, I initially put it in here, because the, the the ship that I was on where I would give this uh, lecture, we would go and see the various Ford sites. But nobody even sort of mentioned this in passing. And I think it is important. So Henry Ford himself was a lifelong anti-Semite. So he purchased the Dearborn Independent, which uh, was a local newspaper that basically he turned into his mouthpiece on a whole host of things, but most famously uh, for diatribes against Jews. And this was a paper that was required to be uh, taken and distributed to all the dealers. So everybody had to have this. Now, eventually, uh, the paper would be shut down because he would be sued for slander by a Jew named Alan Sapiro. And he would shut this down, and he was one of the first to hire a uh, PR firm to basically revive his image, and he had a public apology. But nonetheless, I think it's very telling. You know, here's Henry Ford, a very smart individual, had all sorts of patents on everything, copyrights and that sort of thing, never copyrighted this material. 
And it was later collected, as you see there, and published uh, in a volume called The International Jew, which was distributed in Nazi Germany. And if you read Mein Kampf, Henry Ford is the only individual American who's mentioned favorably by Adolf Hitler. And in fact, uh, again, so the paper gets shut down in 1927 after this lawsuit. But in 1938, the Nazi party uh, will award Henry Ford the Golden Eagle, which is the highest uh, uh, non-citizen award that you can receive in 1938. So over a decade later on his 75th birthday. Now we are gonna shift gears and go into the discussion of the car, the universal car as it was known at the time. And this is uh, a picture of one from the, uh, the, uh, the Ford uh, Transportation Museum there. Now, if, if you know something about this, it's, it's kind of unusual to see one this color because uh, Mr. Ford famously said, uh, any customer can have any color they like as long as it's black. And now I'll tell you, uh, that wasn't because Henry Ford loved the color black. It was because that was the paint that dried the quickest. And so that enabled the line to move along. And so we're gonna discuss uh, that. Now, the early attempts Ford did make in his backyard. So what you have there is his quadricycle. That's his first car. And what you have there is his shop that again is preserved at uh, Greenfield uh, Village. But this was not a heavy production model. This was the late 1890s. He was just really getting started. Now, uh, he will make a couple of far false starts. He will actually start two other companies before the Ford Motor Company that will fail. And initially, they weren't doing anything very different from the other manufacturers of, at the time. At this time, you, the car manufacturer is fairly small. It's highly skilled groups of people working on one car start to finish. And that is the method that Ford uh, was using for these early companies. Now, in 1903, he's going to win a race, and that, in fact, is him there on uh, the left, for those of you looking at the screen. Uh, and this is going to give him some money, but more importantly, some notoriety. And that is how he's going to get the stockholders and the uh, capital to start the Ford Motor Company, about $100,000 worth of stock and about $28,000 in cash gets that started. Now, he himself would not become a majority stockholder until 1907. And this was one of the issues that he had when we're gonna talk about his vision here uh, in just a second, because he wanted to operate very differently than, uh, again, as I said, that standard sort of practice of small groups of highly skilled artisans working on a custom-made car from start to finish. Here's what Ford's vision was. He said, I will build a car for the great multitude." It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials by the best men to be hired after the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise. But it will be so low in price that no man making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with his family the blessings of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. So he really hit on something here. And uh, it's, it is very prophetic in a lot of ways. Now, we don't necessarily think of enjoying hours of pleasure in God's great open sp spaces in our vehicles uh, today. At least I don't. And, and certainly uh, I, I'm from Canton and driving out here. It was a nice uh, uh, ride out there on uh, Route 2 was most of the way. When I got through Cleveland and to come to Toledo, I sat there for a while. And now that tends to be the thing, right? We think of uh, traffic, right? This this sort of uh, urban problem, but that is, you know, not the farthest thing from the mind. There, there is no traffic congestion when Henry Ford is is dreaming up the car, the universal car. And so this is what we've got. There we go. So that's the car there driving. They have a whole fleet of these. Uh, this was earlier this summer at uh, Greenfield Village. So I wanted you to see one in action, but this is what he's going to hit on. The Model T, the Tin Lizzie. 
comes out in 1908 and is indeed easy to operate, easy to repair. It is very dependable, even in adverse conditions. And again, you have to remember, we're talking about dirt roadways here, horrible conditions. So this thing had to be uh, rugged. It was only offered in one color, and it's the only model the company will produce until 1928. So that's pretty extraordinary. Now, Mrs. Ford did not drive a Ford. She drove a custom-built electric car. This is uh, from 1914, and you can see her car again at the, the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, this was, again, one of those special builds. And to give you some idea of the price, the average sort of high-end gas electric car at this time is about $1,600. Mrs. Ford's electric car will be 3,500. But already by 1914, Ford is a multimillionaire. So they didn't have to worry about that. And so this was considered a proper vehicle, especially for someone of the upper class, because the Fords, even the Model Ts, with their cranks, they could kick. You could, their people would often break their wrists. And so, and you had to get out to start it in adverse conditions. So that was not considered appropriate for a lady. And so Mrs. Ford did not drive. Now, this is the first uh, Ford factory on Mack Avenue. It unfortunately burnt down in the 1940s, but you can go see this uh, smaller reconstruction of it on the grounds again there of Greenfield Village. But it's going to be at the Piquette plant. Uh, where the birthplace of the Model T really is. And what you see there, that sort of cordoned off wooden structure, is this was a sort of secret room in the back of the plant where they worked on the design of the Model T for over a year to get the, the right design, the right materials, to figure out how this thing was really going to be uh, rugged but easy to construct. But it's really going to take off, and what we're going to talk about and focus primarily on is when they really start uh, building a factory from scratch, and that's going to be at Highland Park and later on the Rouge. And I already had a gentleman here today say that he had worked at the, the, the Rouge or maybe is still working at the Rouge. Yes. Uh, so this is what we're talking about, a new factory for a new car at Highland Park. And so... We're going to go into the details of this, but just to give you some idea of the cost reductions. So in 1910, the cost of the Model T was $950. That's still pretty expensive, but that's substantially less than $1,600. By the time we get to 1925, it is down to $290. And at that point, they're turning, turning out a finished car every 10 seconds, about 9,000 units per day, netting around $25,000 a day and making Ford one of the first billionaires. And so uh, we see there again that early smaller plant and Mac Avenue that they're going to rent the Piquette uh, uh, plant. There's the first one that they're going to own. And then Highland Park, that's really going to be where the Model T production comes alive. And then finally, uh, the even more advanced and really vertically integrated uh, River Rouge. And to give you some idea of the perspective, the Highland Park uh, factory was about 68, 60 acres. The River Rouge was about 1,100. So a tremendous expansion. So what, what, what does this uh, transformation really look like? Well, it is machines and men galore. Now, one of the misconceptions, and I'm going to quote here uh, from one of uh, the uh, one of the lead engineers and one of the managers at Ford, uh, Mr. Charles Sorensen. To give you some idea, here's what he had to say from his 1956 autobiography. Henry Ford had no ideas on mass production. He wanted to build a lot of autos. He was determined, but like everyone else at that time, he really didn't know how. In later years, he was glorified as the originator of the mass production idea. Far from it. He just grew into it like the rest of us. The essential tools and the final assembly line with its many integrated feeders resulted from an organization which continually experimented and which was continually experimenting and improvising to get better production. And while you can't take necessarily every uh, uh, thing that these uh, 
people who obviously have a vested interest in, in presenting a certain perspective, uh, you always have to read it with a little bit of a grain of salt. He is nonetheless correct in many of the main things. So this really wasn't a revolution in the actual production methods. It was a revolution in the application of them collectively. Um, because he brought together many other existing technologies. For instance, meatpacking in Cincinnati and Chicago had conveyor belts. There were interchangeable parts that go back from uh, the U.S. Armory days. Machine mechanization and standardization, which had come into fashion at Singer Sewing Company, an international harvester. There were the canning industries, which had sequential production. And so this was uh, a, a widespread application. What you see here, uh, the two uh, main photos in the sort of background there are the machine shops. And that is what we're really going to see, an increase in machines. So eventually, the Highland Park will have about 14,000 employees, but about 15,000 machines. So more machines than men. And as you see there, there is one uh, man operating that machine that's going to uh, do just one single operation, but do it accurately. And I also want to, again, mention that this continual experimenting and openness to ideas is very important. And I'm just going to list off some of the names because this all did not come from Henry Ford. People like Harry Willis, Charles Sorensen, John Lee, Max Wallering, Walter Flanders, Pete Martin, Carl M., Oscar Bornholt, Freed Deal, Albert Kahn, Charles Morgana, Charles Lewis, James Pur Purdy, Clarence Avery, all these people were in some way involved. Sometimes these were professional engineers. Sometimes these were people who uh, worked on the line and came up with one uh, adaptation to a specific machine. But that uh, it really is a collective effort. Anytime you have something on this scale, there's no way one person can come up with all the ideas. But it was the openness to be uh, willing to try anything. If it increased production, we're going to do it. And so that openness really ramped up production in a tremendous way. And so uh, this single product is very important. As I said, he's only going to make this one model until 1927. So you only have to worry about making parts for it. He's going to do time studies. Uh, and this comes out of a work of a man named uh, Frederick Taylor, who had looked at sort of manual uh, uses of time to say shovel coal and that sort of thing into a furnace well they're going to apply the same thing to uh the line in developing the cars this in interchangeable parts but being able to not only do it in quantity but make sure that they have the quality so he's going to have all sorts of people that are going to be in charge of quality control that are going to go out when they order the machines the different drill presses and that sort of thing to make sure that the manufacturers of the actual machines are indeed making these to the specific spec specifications that the ford uh, company demand this increase in mechanization and it's the breaking apart also of uh the mechanization and what what do i mean by that well as I said, mostly the auto industry was an artisanal business. So you had these skilled artisans that really didn't need much more than their toolkit, and they could single-handedly, if need be, build an entire auto themselves. The Ford company is going to take the exact opposite approach. He's going to break things down to the simplest motion that you can possibly do and do it over and over and over and over again. And so instead of having the standard machinery, which was a multi-purpose machine that you had to know how to operate that could maybe do 35 or 40 different actions, he's gonna break these machines apart and design new machines that only do one piece of that. And so now you're only gonna have uh, this one machine that will drill this series of holes and it will take seven seconds to do that. And that's what the machine is going to do over and over and over and over again. And what, what you see there, I want to point this out in this, uh, this photo here. Uh, we're going to talk about this in just a second, but that is the moving assembly line. That's really going to be sort of the linchpin of this. That was really going to, all these things were vitally important, but that's the one. Once they figure out the moving assembly line, that's when things just absolutely explode. And it was tried first here. What you're seeing is that the uh, magneto assembly. And so you see the workers there. Again, it's broken down to very simple motions. Each person is doing one little thing. And you can see, rather than having the people take the time to go and get the bolts or the nuts to put them on, you have them right there in the bins underneath. And they can just 
put them on and it moves right on down the line. And as I said there, this is a picture, uh, and I illustrate this in particular because eventually it would be applied to many aspects, but it comes in first at the magneto assembly, but it's probably most dramatically demonstrated at the, uh, the level of the chassis because this was very complicated, very time consuming. It would take about 12 men, about 13 hours to assemble a chassis. Once they figure out, figure out the chain moving assembly line, they're gonna get it down to an hour and 33 minutes. So really dramatic increase in production. Now, as I said, uh, this is the only car that they are going to make until 1928 when the new model comes out. They're gonna shut down in uh, 1927 having made 15 million. And the market share uh, is absolutely astounding. So at this point, Almost 50% of the cars on earth are Fords. They're never gonna capture that same amount, nor will anyone capture that amount of market share ever again. So it's really uh, just absolutely uh, amazing to think about that. And it sort of, in a way, the Model T, some people have proposed was a victim of its own success because once you had one of these things, and especially with these gradual upgrades and the interchangeable parts that you could get when they break from the dealer, why did you need to go and get another vehicle? But of course, this is where sort of GM outpaced Ford because he didn't want to switch. He didn't want to have an annual model or sort of superfluous things to, to advertise, to bring people in, to get the new model every year. But that uh, he ended up losing market share, and that's why eventually they had to shut down and retool. And you can imagine a tremendous cost in doing that. And you'll see sort of a shift uh, right after this period in the 30s and the 40s into what we call sort of flexible mass production. We're not really going to go into that uh, too much, but I did want to mention that's sort of where this goes after, after the Model T. Now... I always, whenever I can, I like to bring in sort of other types of media. Uh, we've got a lot of lovely images here, and I'm very thankful. In a, in a minute, we'll show some from uh, uh, the collection, actually, that was originally here at the uh, National Museum of the Great Lakes that was been donated to Bowling Green uh, University. It's always nice when you're giving a talk at a place to use some of their archival materials, so I'm definitely going to do that. But I'm going to now attempt to show you if the video will cooperate with me uh, a little bit of another way to sort of look in from the worker's eye view and start to get in a, a little bit on their perspective. And that is by looking at the Detroit industrial murals. Is it going to play? Here we go. There we go. So these are, if you've ever been to it, at the Detroit Institute of Art. They are sort of the crown jewel of the collection there. They were financed by Edsel Ford in 1933 in the midst of the depression for $20,000. But, and what you're seeing basically are a series of uh, panels covering all four walls, three stories high, depicting different aspects of the working experience of people primarily in the Ford Rouge plant. Now, Kind of a little bit of strange bedfellows here. So uh, there you have uh, on your left, uh, Edsel and Henry Ford. And then does anybody know who that is on the right? Either of the two people? Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Very, very good. Known Marxists. So amazing. But we have to remember, this is the depression. So... Capitalism was sort of losing some of its legitimacy. And importantly, Diego Rivera uh, was still very much on the side of 
uh, sort of modern technology and uh, human advancement through technology. A lot of artists at this time, you have to remember, this is only uh, a, a little over a decade after the First World War. And many of the people who saw sort of technological advances uh, as sort of the salvation had witnessed the destructive power that sort of uh, heavy industry and technology could bring to bear on humanity and were very disillusioned by this. But Diego Rivera was not. And uh, so he was very positive, came out and did a series of uh, sketches and then painted uh, the now very famous murals. Now, they were condemned when they were they first appeared, uh, not because of uh, his sort of communist uh, leanings, but uh, because of an image uh, that was disliked by the uh, the Catholic Church. And we're not really going to go in uh, to that too much because that's not a part of our story. But sort of because of this initial controversy, 10,000 people showed up the first day. And so guess what? The museum director said, I think we're going to keep these. <laughs> Um, and so they did, and it was defended by Edsel and the director, and they did stay. They came under attack again in 1952. Anybody imagine why? McCarthy, exactly. Again, and what you see here is the director putting up a sign, which basically is a long-winded way of saying, yes, we deplore Mr. Uh, Rivera's politics as despicable, but nonetheless, these are an amazing work of art, a tremendous tribute to the workers, the people of Detroit, and so they are staying. Uh, the, the, there was uh, talk about whitewashing them, having them destroyed, uh, maybe turning into a little vestibule or something like that. Thankfully, they were not. And as I said, today, they are the sort of crown jewel of the Detroit Institute of Art. And if you ever get a chance, if you're from Toledo, it's not that far up to Detroit. I highly uh, um, encourage you to go and see them because they are beautiful. And we're only going to touch on a few things here, uh, but you could literally spend hours and um, – I think it's on most afternoons, they have some docents in there as well, just walking around. And you can ask them about any individual panel, and they'll go much more in depth than I have the information here in front of me uh, to go into all of this. And it's really, uh, a, a, really a, a tremendous uh, experience. So I highly encourage you to do that. So we have the Great Lakes which figure prominently over the West Portico. Portico. There, there we see sort of the classic freighters going each way there. And of course, Mr. Ford had his own fleet. So he initially is gonna buy some older ships in uh, right after World War uh, I. But pretty soon, he's going to get into building his own. So in 1923, the Lorraine Shipbuilding Yard here in the Midwest in Ohio well, is going to churn out the Henry Ford II and the Benson Ford uh, the following year. And it was very nice. Somebody brought in one of the uh, the suits there from the Henry Ford uh, the II. Uh, so... That was absolutely a tremendous. Thank you for that. And unfortunately, you won't be able to see this, guys, online. But there's also the uh, the Ford Tug, the Buttercup, that someone has brought in a lovely uh, model of. Over the next decade, he will add another dozen ships. And again, mostly these are going to be moving around raw materials. So uh, coal to Duluth, uh, iron and lumber to Detroit and uh, into Toledo as well. And this was sort of uh, part of a um, expanding uh, sort of production scheme, which we now call vertical integration. And so already by the 1920s, Henry Ford has the idea, instead of just buying bodies, buying pieces, he wants to control the whole thing. And so especially by the time we get to the Rouge, he's going to have a working steel mill on the premises. He wants to, he's got docks there for the ships to come and go. That is the whole idea to own everything from the raw materials to the finished car rolling out of the factory door. And to that end, uh, he's going to go after these sort of things. So he's going to buy the Imperial Mine uh, in the Upper Peninsula. He's going to have coal mines in Kentucky and West Virginia. He's going to start the Fordson Coal Company to do this. Uh, in 1920, he's going to buy 220,000 acres of the Blueberry Mine. There's the Iron Mountain Mine and surrounding lumber uh, forest, 35, 350, excuse me, thousand acres. He's going to buy another 400,000 acres with docks on Lake Superior a few years later. He's going to afford 
uh, form the Ford Transportation Company, buy a small rail line here in Ohio to transport his goods uh, when he couldn't do it with water transport. And of course, uh, uh, you've seen uh, probably or heard of the Ford Trimower. He's going to put his foot into um, aviation. And what you have here is uh, what you can see uh, on the slide there of the Upper Peninsula are the mines that he will have by the 1940s. There's uh, uh, the layout of just the sort of mining uh, operation there at uh, Iron Mountain. And in one of the most interesting things that I found, uh, and there's actually been a, a lovely book uh, written about this. I haven't gotten all the way uh, through it yet, but one of the things he also wanted to capture was rubber production because the British kind of owned the corner on latex. And obviously there was a lot of that going into the cars and going into the tires. And so he will purchase, and what you see there on the right is uh, what uh, he termed Fordlandia and Belterra. It's gonna be land about the size of, uh, a little over the size of Connecticut along one of the tributaries of the Amazon. And we'll try to have a rubber plantation down there. He'll pour about $20 million into this and it will eventually fail. But nonetheless, it shows you the extent to which he was willing to go outside even of the U.S. to try and, try and control and have this completely vertically integrated factory system. Now, we're going to turn our attention again to uh, those people that I really find most interesting because that is the, 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 the people that most of us would have been drawn from, what our experiences uh, would have been like. And that is the workers themselves. And what you see here is a whole bunch of the workers standing out uh, side of the Highland Park uh, factory uh, around 1917, I believe. And so we do have a few testimonials, but again, I like to show these are just a couple of the panels from um, the Rouge uh, uh, murals there uh, from the Detroit Institute of Art. And what you see here, what this demonstrates is this is brawn over brains. You can see the muscles straining to push this heavy machinery around. They're almost extensions of the machines to me when I see this. And you'll also notice we have people of sort of all different ethnicities, races, colors. Now, this wouldn't have been the way it was initially. There were African-Americans, but most of them uh, did not work on the main floor until the late 1920s. And we'll talk about where they are in a little bit. So now we're gonna sort of turn to their perspective, the workers. And so while all this, uh, this mechanization and the things uh, that the Ford company was doing to speed up production was great for the company and arguably very great for most of the consumers, wasn't necessarily that great for uh, the workers in the actual factory. So you had a tremendous amount of absenteeism, especially as uh, mechanization increase. Daily averages about 10 to 15 percent. The yearly average by 1913 is 370 percent turnover in a single year. So that is that is the highest level of any car manufacturer in Detroit. And so that becomes a tremendous problem for the Ford Motor Company. This de-skilling, as I mentioned, having these machines do one action, your brain is out of it at this point. You're doing this repeated action over and over and over and over again for at this point, six days a week, 10 hours a day. There are also language and cultural barriers. At this point, again, because of this sort of de-skilling, the artisans are either going to leave or be pushed out. And so what you're going to have is a tremendous amount of immigrant labor. So by 1914, there's going to be about 12,880 workers, 9,109 of whom were foreign born, mostly Poles, Russians, Romanians, Italians, Sicilians, Austro-Hungarians, and the largest uh, domestic population is going to come from the South. So there's going to be language and cultural barriers to making this thing work with so many different languages in there. You're going to have this constant speed up because rather than sort of being managed by your peers with the other artisans and working at the pace that you choose, you're now tied to the pace of the machine. So as fast as that machine can work, you have to be ready to put the piece in. And there are going to be all sorts of resistances to this. So 
workers are going to uh, institute the slowdown when they can coordinate it or try and slow down at their individual uh, station. There's early labor organizations like the International Workers of the World that are coming into Detroit talking about unionization. So there are these sorts of pressures. Uh, and I did want to just give, I always like to give one or two quotes when I can. So uh, here's the perspective of one worker uh, from the early 1920s. He said, in the time that I worked there, he was a 10 year employee when he left, I was continuously honored with increased production until the best days of my life had been sapped out. Workers cease to be human beings as soon as they enter the gates of the shop. They become automatons. I've seen many healthy workers who have gone to Ford and come out human wrecks. And there was a term that they termed Forditis <laughs> that the workers had uh, for this sort of numbing effect of working uh, at 10 hours a day, doing these same repetitive motions all that time. Now, all these things and you can imagine were not just problems for workers, but things like absenteeism were slowing production. And so do, do, you, do you remember, have you heard of the Ford $5 day? It's one of those things that unfortunately, I mean, my, uh, again, talking about my grandmother, she, if you, you asked about the Ford $5 day, she knew immediately. It's kind of getting lost, unfortunately, now. People don't seem to remember that, but this was fairly revolutionary. Institutes it in 1914. And as you can see, it was decried in the papers sometimes as uh, Ford is betraying his class. This is insane. This is just off the wall, crazy. What is he thinking? Because the going wage at this point in Detroit is about $2.40 a day. So the $5 day essentially doubles that wage. But uh, even though the press sort of portrayed it as this, the Ford company was very upfront about this and said, no, 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 no. This is not just a wage increase. This is an early form of profit sharing. Because the idea was, uh, you know, they wanted you to sort of give up on these, these things and just accept that you're going to be essentially a human cog in this machine. And so if we could keep production up, then you're going to be rewarded with your share of the profits. And so here, again, comes with strings attached, always with strings attached. None of this stuff is for free. So you had to be married or over 22 if you were single. You had to be with the company for six months or more. And this third provision, after a man has been carefully looked up and the company is satisfied that he will not debauch the additional money he receives. Rather vague. Well, how are you going to monitor this? <laughs> you're not you're not actually wrong. He's going to institute something initially called the sociology department that will be later renamed the education department, where they will hire uh, people coming out of actually the this sort of medical facility that they had on board to go out and investigate your background, to go to your house, to go through your things to make sure you didn't have any inappropriate literature, to make sure you weren't drinking. They would go around to your friends, family. If they had mentioned something, you had to own up to it and say what it was. To teach the, man the employees the manner of thrift, sobriety, and better living. So there's going to be etiquette classes that you have to attend. There's going to be an English school we'll look at in a minute. Now, interestingly, they did not tend to investigate the managers or the office workers. This was primarily aimed at the foreign labor force. They kept rolling records on all the factory employees. And this would become particularly onerous because during World War I, they would, uh, the Ford company would give these records to a sort of clandestine agency of the Justice Department who would use it to deport people. They would arrange for loans and housing arrangements for you but you had to live where Ford told you because this was a, a bit of social planning and engineering, not just a wage scheme. Uh, the idea was you had to become American, middle-class American in Ford's eyes. So you could not live in an ethnic neighborhood surrounded by your 
your peers or other people from the old country. You had to live in an area that they designated was appropriate. Sometimes you would have to give up uh, if you're uh, sort of the things that you had, uh, had brought furniture and things, if they were raggedy, you had to get rid of it. They would tell you where to live and you couldn't have borders either. This was supposed to be a nuclear family arrangement. And it was touted as voluntary, but if you didn't do this within six months, you were dismissed. So it actually became rather compulsory. And that was certainly the case. And what we have here are a couple of pictures from the English school. So after you would finish working your 10-hour uh, day, you would have to go home and change because you couldn't be in your raggedy um, uh, work clothes. You had to come back looking nice. And there's there you see them out in the green there uh, outside of the Highland Park uh, to attend your English classes. And again, they taught etiquette, uh, what was considered you know appropriate for uh middle class Americans. So you had to give up your sort of ethnic garb. They talk about some of the Turkish employees not uh, wearing the fez anymore. You had to become American. And sort of the extreme version of that uh, was the melting pot ceremony. So once you had completed this uh, etiquette, once you understood what it meant to uh, be thrifty, to live in a middle class uh, sort of neighborhood with middle class values, and once you had completed the English school program, you would bring whatever trappings you had, garb uh, from the old country, you would take it with you. And that's it's hard to make out here, but those two uh, sort of uh, black lines on the right, that's supposed to be smokestacks from a ship. You would come off the ship, descend into the melting pot, have your foreign impurities burned away and come out waving an American flag and you were now Americanized. And again, if you resisted this, you would be pushed out. Now we're gonna talk uh, a little bit about uh, the African Americans. So Ford was one of the first to employ African-Americans. Nobody in Detroit was doing this. And he did nonetheless, and they, they were offered the $5 day. And I do want to say, ladies, there were about um, 300 employees in 1914. Initially, you were not allowed to have the $5 day, but the women argued that they should be able to. And the Ford company conceded on this. They said, as long as you were unmarried, you could receive the $5 a day, but it was understood if you were married, you were no longer able to work at the Ford company. But women were eventually able to receive the $5 a day, as did the African-Americans. So this was an incredible wage for an African-American to receive. But the benefit here that the company was able to uh, sort of derive from this was that you could put them in the worst jobs and particularly in the foundry. This was the most dangerous the most unhealthy uh, environment to be in. And I want to read you one little excerpt. Uh, and again, this is from much later, after, you're, after we have increased health and safety standards, after the union's in there. But nonetheless, it gives you uh, a perspective. And then I'm going to ask you who you think this person is, because you've probably heard of him when I, when I finish this. The foundry was a hell, a living nightmare. Hot blowing furnaces, loud clanging noises, dust, smoke, and soot everywhere. Red molten metal pouring out of huge stoves on conveyor belts. When the bright liquid steel arrived at my station, it would be cooling down from red hot to black hot. We had to wear large asbestos gloves to keep our hands from burnings while we knocked the newly formed nuts and bolts from their casings. After five minutes on the first day, I was dead. When we got a 10 minute break, I stumbled out of the foundry room. I could see people talking, but I couldn't hear a word they were saying. He was momentarily deaf. I sat there coughing up black gook from my chest. Finally, the eight hours were over and I, I could hardly walk. My wrists were swollen, my body stiff, my head and arms, ears, everything ached. I slowly made it to the car, a crippled man. Any guesses? Barry Gordy, founder of Motown Records. One day in the foundry in the early 50s. <laughs> uh, so over, so the foundry staff, over 50% was African-American. Only 5% was white. So if you were African-American, you were by and large going into the foundry. But again, because this was one of the best jobs you could get already, and then you could get that $5 day, it was almost always filled. 
And here again is the sort of uh, mural depiction there of the furnaces actually burning and the men wearing the suits there, all oh, those incredibly high temperatures. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the, uh, the sort of management uh, structure uh, because you did see a shift. Again, we had people uh, resisting and what we have are more foremen. So in 1913, the foreman ratio is one to every 53 workers. By 1917, it's one in 15. You cannot talk on the line. It has to be silent. You're only to do your work and that is it. And so uh, you're gonna gradually see as again, as that production is sort of falling off with the Model T, it's going to be hard for Ford to keep this up. It's resented by the workers and resisted. He's not going to be able to pay. First, they increase the $6, then the $7 day. They just can't uh, afford to do it. And so they will gradually shift from more of a carrot, the sort of, you know, carrot with strings attached to a much more uh, direct stick approach. And what you see here, well, two things. What is this image here? Uh, it's a steam turbine, and this is one of the few places where a composite, again, we always have to read everything with a sort of discerning eye. This is art in particular, so this is not true to life. Uh, but this is a composite here of Edison and Ford, the only, only one of two places where Henry Ford himself appears in the murals. And that's a giant steam turbine behind it, but what does it look like? An ear, yes, they're gonna start to employ spies on the line to listen, to again, keep the unions out. And again, I did, I forgot to mention this, the $5 day, some historians have argued, this was also to preempt the IWW, the International Workers of the World, had been there the season before in 1913 and said they were coming back for Ford in 1914. So this was also in some ways uh, a much higher wage to try and block that, which they successfully did. Again, Ford won't be unionized until 1941, and we'll talk about that in just a, just a minute here. So that, that image that you see then on the right, that is, again, a composite of uh, sort of uh, one of the, the foreman shop floor managers, but also sort of the strong arm men, a combination of a man named Mead Bricker and another man named Harry Bennett. And there is the real life Harry Bennett, uh, very confident after a hearing um, where you see there on the left about what is about to take place. Uh, you see those are the sort of Ford hired thugs there. Those are members on the right uh, advocating for uh, unionization at Ford and what becomes known as the Battle of the Overpass, where uh, basically these Ford thugs and that uh, led by Harry Bennett, who uh, never had an official title with the Ford company, was an ex-boxer, had ties to the mafia, and was basically the strong arm man. And what you see there, uh, these are the few images because uh, the Ford men tried to keep the press out, but nonetheless capture uh, them beating up uh, and severely beating uh, some of the members uh, of the UAW trying to organize outside the plant. Uh, earlier, actually right before Diego Rivera had come out, there had been a hunger strike outside the Ford plant and several workers, five had been shot and killed. No one was ever brought to trial. It was just let go. Same thing, nobody goes to court after the Battle of the Overpass, and Ford will uh, remain ununionized really until 1941 as part of the war effort. The National Labor Relations Board will basically say, you have to do this. And what you see there, uh, does anybody know who that gentleman is? Walter Ruther, very good. And if you notice, folks, He's there at the Battle of the Overpass, too. He was there from uh, the beginning. And yes, yeah, so unionization will happen in 1941 for the Ford Marty Company. Most of the other uh, companies were in uh, 36 and 37, uh, the famous Flint sit-down strikes, uh, but not going to happen at Ford until 1941. So I'm going to turn things over to questions here in just a second, but I want to just briefly uh, run over the whole world that this sort of creates. So uh, it creates, for one thing, the suburbs. That doesn't exist before the car. 
when you have, uh, and people lose sight of this fact, in the United States, we had the best public transportation system in the world in 1900. That completely goes away because all the money goes into building roads, essentially. And that system is allowed to die. You have the rise of the suburbs. You have this car culture that develops, right? It becomes a rite of passage. Uh, it, it becomes a symbol of America in many ways. You have this tremendous infrastructure that gets built in order um, to make this a reality, right? You have the interstate highway system. We literally still spend billions of dollars a year reviving or building new infrastructure. Uh, and so I want to mention just uh, one of the side effects here, traffic, uh, pollution, obviously, because what was in gasoline until 1986? Lead. Yes, then we have the CO2 emissions. So again, at the time, the car was touted as a much cleaner alternative to horses, right? Because there's manure everywhere. No one was thinking about these long-term sort of uh, impacts of things. And I always like to show this with, a, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but I think it's uh, important. I'll give you a clue. This is deaths. Deaths. Graphs of two, two deaths. What do you think? Any guesses? One is, one is car accidents. Very good. Which one? The right, the giant one. That's all U.S. war fatalities from 1776 until the present. Now, I've been challenged on this, and it's correct. I'm sure per man hour, it's very different if you were to do that. But nonetheless, up until now, after the facts sort of came out by the 1950s, we knew this, but you weren't reasonably expecting to die when you went into a car. <laughs> and you have to admit, if you're going to war, there's some reasonable expectation that might occur. So perhaps a better graph is this. And this is from the National Safety Council. And this is comparing, it's hard to see on the small screen, I apologize, but the green is auto deaths. <laughs> and what you have, the other ones are bus travel, train travel, and air travel. So what you see is regardless of that, personal vehicle travel is 20 times more deadly than bus travel, 17 times more deadly than train travel, and 595 times more deadly than air travel. No, this is per passenger deaths per 100 million passenger miles. That's that's the way that they that they figure it. And so it has turned out to be a real mixed blessing. You have indeed an increase in home ownership increase in wealth that many of these immigrant families could not have imagined, especially in 1900. But unfortunately, there are negative side effects to this. And in places like Detroit, you've seen a a, a real gutting uh, when, when the sort of one horse town, when the heavy industry goes out, a dramatic decrease in the standard of living and in the number of people living there, just to give you one statistic. So at its height in the mid 40s, Detroit had about 1.8 million people in the greater metropolitan area. And one of the uh, smallest margins of difference in the inequality of wealth anywhere in the world. In 2023, the population is only about 640,000 and it has one of the greatest rates of inequality. So uh, a mixed blessing, and I'll leave you with this quote and then we'll open it up to uh, any questions. So this is, uh, I remember I, I talked about that, uh, that uh, book I mentioned at the very beginning called Car Country. It's great, I highly encourage that you read it if you're interested in this and sort of the whole uh, impact it covers really the, the early period from 1900 through about the 1960s. Uh, and he says, when you think about it, the car has rebuilt the American landscape in ways that allows drivers to overcome longstanding natural limits on personal transportation. In doing so, the United States has delivered unprecedented freedom, mobility, flexibility to the vast majority of its inhabitants. Yet the same changes that broke down old barriers to easy transportation also wove growing dependence on cars into the very landscape. It has made dramatically, it has been 
The car has made it dramatically easier to drive, for example, helping expanded home ownership, as I mentioned, previously unfathomable levels and making real estate investments more profitable and secure. Yet it also has drawbacks, most notably that this car country, as he calls it, one size fit all landscape does not in fact fit all. It only fits cars. To take an agricultural metaphor, car country is a monoculture, a landscape designed to maximize the benefits of car mobility. Yet its success, yet it succeeds by imposing, imposing a brittle simplicity on the landscape that sacrifices environmental resiliency and complexity, not just ecological, but social, technological, and economic as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And again, I will take any questions. And if I don't know them, uh, I will I will be very honest and upfront. Like I said, it's a vast, massive uh, uh, subject, and uh, and I may not have the answer. So I saw a question here, and then question there. Yes, in the in the green here. Yeah, you you uh, mentioned that there was a huge turnover in the number of employees in these plants, mm -hmm. and then he instituted the five dollar an hour wage. How did that affect that turnover? Yes. It, and, and also those restrictions that he had to qualify for the $5 an hour wage, what percentage of the employees would qualify for that and those restrictions? Okay. So I'll go with the, the first uh, question first. So he did see a dramatic drop off. It went below 50% from 370 to below 50%. So you still had some significant turnover. And again, for some of these things, it's very hard because either they didn't keep records on these things or they aren't public or they got destroyed, but that's the estimates. Now, the Ford Motor Company claimed that 80% of their employees eventually received a $5 day. But I've not seen anything that did in fact confirm this. And uh, some historians argue that it was probably significantly less than that. But nonetheless, it did make a huge impact in bringing that down from the 370% previously. And then question in the back there, yeah. Holdings in the Paranormal Mines, do they still have a fleet of freighters? They, uh, the second part, I know the answer to, uh, no, they kept they kept their fleet through the 1980s. And actually, when there was a huge economic now, downturn, as many of you know, out in Toledo or the Youngstown area and many of the steel firms went out, the Ford company was able to keep operating because they had their fleet. But after they got through the 80s, he sold, he sells, the company sells them off and there isn't a Ford uh, fleet anymore. The iron holdings, and I don't know actually exactly if, he, if they still have the the mines yes question over here I'm curious about the electric car that you bought mm -hmm. space for his wife mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it was a battery how long was the charge and how did how did they recharge um the 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 second way i know probably i would guess ford probably had a charging station at his house yeah. but in in the early days and this was the way that gasoline uh, work too. It, it would depend. Some of the service stations actually had the first gas stations before you ever had. Uh, and the same thing with some of the refueling for the uh, electric cars, but much less widespread. So I would have to think uh, that Ford probably had one installed in their home. But in terms of how long they lasted, I don't know. I just I just add that sort of in there, sort of whimsy, because I was just walking around the uh, the Ford Museum one day and I saw, oh, Mrs. Ford's car. I'm like, oh, it doesn't look like a Model T. And I was like, oh, wait, she didn't even drive a Ford. <laughs> so I, I unfortunately, I'm sorry. I don't know that much about the 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 custom uh, uh, Ford uh, company that he had car that he had there. Yeah. It's old steel at the Bush plant. It's all, it's no. All, it's so so it's, it's, it out to a steel maker, but it's still being poured there. It's still being poured there, but it's still, it's still a steel mill. does not own. Okay, so it still is a steel mill, but Ford doesn't own. Yeah. It's a bit Russian. Russian. It was Russian. Right. Yeah. 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 Any idea why some of the protests and resulting deaths set up for protests weren't as widespread or well known compared to U.S. Steel and Henry Clay Frick and what he did with those workers? Um, 
I don't know exactly the 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 reasons why that those two uh, specific instances weren't why well, that one wasn't as highly publicized. But that generally really tends to be if you look at the at the the sort of whole documentary uh, record, most of the time uh, the the newspapers, the sort of elite opinion, it tends to side in this period, really until you get into the 30s and 40s and 50s, it tends to side with the the manufacturer. So it just tends not to be, um, you know, as sympathetic. And especially, uh, again, uh, at this time period, uh, you know, this is after uh, the Russian Revolution, there's worries, there had already been the sort of Red Scare in the in the early 20s. And so there were easy ways to demonize these people and say that they were trying, they were Bolsheviks. Actually, uh, Ford would make a, 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 a video cartoon. The Ford company would make one to sort of instruct workers where he would basically link the IWW with the Bolsheviks and try and say that they were the same thing. So all this stuff was sort of in the air. And certainly uh, the, the manufacturers were not making the distinctions and that sort of thing because uh, between, uh, you know, American let's even say American socialism and American communism. That's one of the things that unfortunately we do lose sight of. I mean, there was a viable American socialist party that wasn't a Russian communist uh, socialist party. There, there was an American socialist party that was very strong. Uh, you know, Eugene Debs uh, ran, got three or 4% of the vote. And especially in that period, there was a lot of uh, uh, sort of people joining unions, but there was always this fear and painting it as like, oh, this is trying to be something that's the Bolshevik red sort of uh, thing. And so that stuff just gets sort of swept uh, under the rug. And really, I mean, the, the people really didn't have much of a voice. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, uh, you know, the union, the unions came in to say, basically, hey, uh, we want a voice in this too, because the, the Ford approach is, uh, it is paternalistic, uh, but it's sort of like the worst kind of paternalism, right? It's not, it's saying, it's not asking. He never asked the workers what they wanted. They, he never asked them to participate. He told them it was his idea or the company's idea of what uh, uh, an American worker should be, which is someone that is basically a piece of machinery that will just be quiet and do exactly as it's told. And you're supposed to have these, again, these also these middle-class values. You're supposed to have home ownership. You're supposed to be this nuclear sort of family. So it's being dictated instead of being a sort of dialogue where you're saying, okay, here's what we can offer. Here's what we want. And really getting the perspective of the workers in there, not just this top-down imposition. Yes. Ian, when Henry Ford designed the Model T, he required lightweight and strong steel specialty steel he got that from a timken company can't oh, oh, oh. Yay. oh nice yeah and uh if you go since you live in canton if you go to the frank t bow building which okay used to be the post office yes down across from city hall mm -hmm. that is they have the murals of industry in there not as beautiful as what you show but but that type of thing okay i've been there in, in there in a long time but yes i'll go and check it out because he did i want to mention that too he had labs all over and yes he worked with timken was that the vanadium steel that he because i know he, he had a whole bunch of different so when things I okay fair lane and then up at dearborn they, they had that in our tour oh cool I saw the f-150s being built oh nice that was really cool and uh I've been to Munising, Michigan quite a bit. And that's where he got the wood for the frames for the car. Okay, yeah. Thing. Mm -hmm. And then King's Ford Charcoal Briquettes. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go on forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing went to waste. No, no, he was one of it. And, and I recently, I, I didn't have enough time to integrate it into uh, the presentation to, to today. But there's um, uh, a, a recent article just in the last 10 years where uh, someone went back and looked at this and said, hey, even though maybe we, he wouldn't have necessarily thought it. He was one of the first sort of industrial ecologists, right? He tried to use everything. Like you mentioned the waste to make Kingsford charcoal. He was big with soybean oil. Oh yeah, yeah, he had whole, he had huge hopes for soybean. They tried to do painting with it and all sorts of things, yeah. Yes. Uh, the thing regarding the auto workers in the, I think it was the late twenties, Stalin was trying to get an auto industry going in, in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of, they recruited workers from the Detroit area to go over there. And there's a story, I don't remember the guy's name, but the book's called Coming, Coming Out of the Ice or Coming In Out of the Ice. And he went over with his parents. He was like 14 at the time. And 
he tells about landing up in the up in the northern northern part of Russia, like up by the Finland area. I can't remember the name of the uh -huh. town. And uh, the experiences that his family had, and he had, and, and he was finally he ended up in the gulags. But uh, he finally was able to uh, emigrate from Russia, like in the teens. Oh wow! Uh, but it's, it's an interesting story, and obviously the workers went over there and they go, "Uh oh, this was a mistake." <laughs> that was too late. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's and it's interesting too. I just was reading because again, there's so many. He got into so many. The company got into so many different ventures. I was just reading an article uh, yesterday. I, again, I didn't have time to even finish it. Um, where they were talking about, yeah, there were even representatives from even at the same time that you know Ford in 1919 is condemning Bolshevism and talking about this. Members of the Ford like executive committee met with uh, members from the Soviet Party leadership in Washington to discuss factory building in in Russia and and how to do it and and some of them uh, I haven't really gotten to that part but they went over to Russia and inspected the factories and offered suggestions and all sorts of things so yeah i mean there is this this connection there even in in the midst of what we would think is like man this is untenable but nonetheless they were they were doing it yeah yes you were you referenced this, there were some bleak things the way you know turnover i mean safety and mm -hmm. hardships but but then there are also some plus of learning english in 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 general standard of living kind of in yes and uh other industries took on the mechanization and the manufacturing techniques so it was a, this is a start <clears> that it built how was fords uh working with workers better or worse than the other industries that developed after this Wow, that is a huge and expansive <laughs> question. So um, it really, it varied. Uh, I can't speak to every industry. Uh, and certainly most didn't institute something like the $5 day. Um, but it, either through unionization, which which happened often, or or the, the shifts in management and understanding uh, as time went on that people are not just simply machines and starting to bring people into the discussions. That certainly uh, uh, did change industry wide. I will, you're, you're absolutely right. And I didn't address this. That to me, even more than the car itself, that's one of the biggest legacies because it's everywhere. It's, a, it's at Amazon. I mean, you, you see assembly lines everywhere, every factory does this now you know so and and he was sort of the the leader of putting this all together again it wasn't any new revolutionary technology but it was combining of all of these things into one coherent system that was super effective that spread everywhere and is still the legacy like i said you can go to amazon the brand new company and they're using uh you know ford type of things they have time studies all sorts of that and this led into the 20s which would be good for a while mm -hmm. until the end yeah yeah so we kind of is a good thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I certainly, I certainly think there were some very, very positive aspects about it. It's always hard. I mean, it's because how can you say again, and the point of the historian too, and I don't, didn't mention this is we don't really want to make uh, angels and demons. And this is sort of the difference between what somebody like a trained historian will do uh, versus, uh, and I'll pick on both sides of the political aisle here. Uh, when I go into like one of the two remaining bookstores on earth, actual physical ones, uh, way out in Kansas somewhere. Uh, uh, the last time I was in one, I saw a history of oil by Rachel Maddow. And I saw a whole wall of books about killing somebody by Bill O'Reilly, killing Lincoln, killing Caesar, killing this guy, killing this guy. Okay, that is not what the professional historian does. What most of that is, is opinion presented as fact. What the historian do, does, they're gonna give you an interpretation. And what I've presented here is an interpretation and you could interpret some things differently than I certainly have. But um, you're not trying to make, you're not making moral judgments at the end of the day. If you're really doing it, you're not you're not trying to make angels and demons. You're pointing out these things that occurred, that took place, that maybe in our day and age, many of them we would find incredibly invasive and onerous. But on that other hand, very positive aspects as well. And, and to prevent this as a complicated uh, sort of thing and, it, and something that nonetheless did have to be worked out. Because, again, sort of what is telling to me, though, is this didn't work in the end it worked for a little bit but it didn't work long term and it really uh to me things don't 
settle down in a lot of ways until you get unionization, until you get the, the, the workers in there having a voice. Because even if you have the best intentions, I just don't think if you're the manager, you can really understand what that life is like. And I think it's it's fair. These people are producing these things to, to, bring, to bring them in and you see things settle down and get better and the health and safety gets better and the wages increase for a long time until you get to the 70s. And uh, that's really beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But I do think, uh, uh, yeah, I think that that's really the, the essential piece is it, is it really was, the idea was this is what the, the company and the managers wanted and they were trying to solve and address some of these issues because it affected them, but not bringing the workers in, you're always going to have problems if you don't, if you don't bring them in as part of that dialogue. In 1927, you had prohibition as well with his ideas, with Ford's ideas of, of controlling the workers. Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah, but he, well, he was prohibitionist the sort of whole time. You were not expected. That was one of the things that the sociology department went out and looked at. They made sure no alcohol. Now, of course, people did it anyways. But uh, that was the that was the idea. Yeah, and I think we're going to have to wind it up there. One more. I see it. Yeah, you had uh, mentioned when uh, Ford became unionized in 1941, mm -hmm. pressure from the federal government. But Henry had other pressure, didn't he? His his wife, yes, supposedly, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> no, it's, 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 um. Well, it changed to the education department, and I believe it went away in the uh, in the end of the nineteen twenties, and that's when you see the rise, Harry Bennett, and the uh, service service department. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. What's the